Today we'll be talking about uh, correcting the labor market and to try to make, uh, uh, to correct the imbalances and promoting employment and employability. Uh, <clears throat> our first uh, uh, speech will be by welcome and opening remarks. It will be by uh, Mrs. Uh, Barbara Beltrami and uh, she is uh, the vice uh, uh, president of Confindustria and the president of uh, Business Med. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Beltrami had a long uh, experience and big experience in private sector activities and she was also a vice president of Confindustria of uh, Vicenza and uh, she had many responsibilities in uh, Confindustria. Uh, Mrs. Barbara, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Business Med webinar. Let me start by stressing that an effective dialogue should be an important part of the whole process of the building our agenda. Social dialogue is crucial to, ach to achieve balance, sustainability, and inclusive growth, and to face the challenge of the employment-related issue. The Med area, and especially the southern countries, suffer of high youth unemployment and labor market imbalance. The discussion we are having must mark a new stage in our agenda to stimulate dynamic reform of the labor markets. Today, the challenge requires a collective effort. Governments, employment, and workers must work with the spirit of cooperation and mutual trust. We cannot act alone. We cannot act in isolation. We, if we want to achieve our goal, we must work together in order to anticipate the future challenge and opportunities, find a solution and manage, manage the social priorities. The SOLID project is an example of a multi-level consultation that can contribute to find a solution for more resilient and peaceful so, uh, societies. Much will depend on our commitment to build a more effective social dialogue in the MED area. One, one of, the, of the worst uh, legacy of the pandemic will be to rise of income yes. on inquiry, inequalities, Sorry, as well as the young sorry. unemployment, sorry. which is very high in the OECD countries, especially among young adults without a secondary education. Moreover, the pandemic could lead to a lack of interest in the social dialogue because of the econom economic struggle the private sector is facing. On the other hand, the crisis gives us the opportunity to analyze what we could have done better in the past. We have lost jobs, but a new demand for a new kind of jobs and skills has emerged. The MED countries are advancing toward digitalization. We believe that technological progress is a driver for the social progress. It can be helpful to reduce mismatch in the job market. Unfortunately, the existing inequalities we knew before the COVID crisis got worse. The pandemic affected different group of people in different ways. There is even more than that. The economic turmoil caused by the crisis has caused measured imbalances. Our entire business and social environment face a critical situation. Now it's time. It's our duty to reshape the new normal, to find our policies for a stable recovery and restore resilience. Our duty is to build a better future where the health of our social agenda is a decent work for all. As employers, we share the responsibility to secure a lasting recovery that does not leave behind anyone. In conclusion, allow me to say that a productive social dialogue is as crucial to correct the imbalance of our societies. I'm glad to welcome our institutional partner, the International Organization of Employers, the International Labor Organization, and the uh, Union for the Mediterranean. 
your role has been very important in creating an environment of positive dialogue of mutual trust. Today, we will work starting from the outcome of the Social Dialogue Forum held last October, which address how social dialogue could support the economic development in the Euromed countries. I look forward to listening to your remarks and contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we will have a keynote speech with Mr. Mohamed Razaz. Mohamed Razaz is the project uh, project analyst at the Union for the Mediterranean Secretariat. Uh, Mr. Razaz has a long uh, uh, experience in the Commercial International Bank and uh, in some uh, private activities also. He, uh, he shared many, uh, 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 many positions at uh, the Mediterranean level and some in the uh, universities. And uh, uh, Mr. Razaz, uh, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. Well, a very good morning to you all. And first of all, please allow me to thank Business Met for extending this kind invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this second webinar following the very interesting first webinar. And we very much look forward to interesting insights and ideas also by the other participants. We are keen on cementing this partnership with Business Med and other social partners, of course. So um, a decade ago, a very prominent Polish thinker and philosopher, Zygmunt Bauman, coined the term of liquid modernity. And at the time he had in mind the rhythm at which all structures, whether economic, social, or cultural, were being formed and dissolved too quick for any, anyone basically to keep track. So I believe, I dare say, that we have moved from the liquid modernity into an ethereal modernity sorts of, in which the pace is too fast for anyone to keep track, but also the uncertainty is more than any other time that we remember in our modern prehistory, if you may. So it is a modernity or a postmodernism that is so difficult to define. Now, the current global crisis, and I say global crisis, not economic crisis, because more than just economic, it's a humanitarian crisis, of course. This current global crisis has left no stone unturned. We are all very well aware that not all countries and not all regions were affected in the same way or to the same extent by the current crisis. Some countries and some regions were hit harder than others. And this unfortunately applies to the Mediterranean region. Mostly countries and regions that were heavily reliant and dependent on Chinese-led global value chains and supply chains, countries with structural economic vulnerabilities, with persisting budget deficits, with high debt exposure, these countries were hit harder than others. Also countries with low spendings on healthcare, countries that have drifted away from the concept of a welfare state, and now beyond the cold mathematics of statistics and figures that you are all very well aware of, there is a human face. And because this crisis, as I said, in the first place is humanitarian. So some population groups also were hit harder than others. Some segments were affected more than others. And here I'm referring to women, youth, and migrants with limited skills or with a single skill set in a non-strategic sector. Also those who are employed informally, they would bear the brunt of the current crisis. Problem is they had already been underprivileged. There had already been inequality and imbalance. And this has been further aggravated by the current crisis. So these socioeconomic imbalances have been further deepened and made even clearer in the wake of the current pandemic. Unfortunately, these groups are the usual suspects. They are the ones who suffer most with 
or without a crisis, but even more with a crisis. Now, I'm not here today to, to preach doom. No, this is not the idea. Otherwise, we would uh, close that chiringuito, as we say in Spain. This is not the idea, because if anything, history has also taught us that behind and beyond every global crisis, there lurks an opportunity for those who can learn the lessons, those who have the will and the vision to make the change. So there is a lot of talk about the economic sectors that will offer opportunities that will create jobs, that will absorb employment in the post-pandemic horizon. I can tell you, for example, about the blue or the maritime economy, about the green economy, now essential for a green recovery. It's as evident as Euclid. No, it's, it's, it's very uh, clear, no? the green deal, the green recovery. But also sectors like creative economy, like social economy, like all the segments related to global value chains, because we do foresee a reconfiguration of value chains and a near shoring or re-shoring of some of these value chains for obvious economic and security reasons. Now, having said that, um, the idea here is to make sure that uh, uh, for any talk about a post-pandemic recovery without an effective social dialogue would be a counterfeit discourse. It would be a false narrative. And why am I saying that? Because whenever we talk about, for example, um, active labor market policies, no, that uh, in some countries around the world are providing best practices and success stories during times of crisis. And here I'll cite some of the examples mentioned in the report issued by ILO. You know, countries like Denmark uh, that have managed to reduce the increase in unemployment during times of crisis. Countries like South Korea that through government spending have been able to subsidize and to offer subventions and assistance. No, unfortunately, in the Mediterranean, I cannot think of so many success stories at this point in time. But again, uh, first of all, social dialogue and if an effective social dialogue has proven to be a precondition for effective uh, active labor market policies that would generate employment, that would stimulate government spending and boost social confidence and consumer confidence. This is something very important in times of uncertainty. Um, now, Beyond the active labor market policies, one of the immediate repercussions of the current crisis is the expansion of the informal economy, a rise in uh, illegal migration, a rise in youth unemployment in the region. These are whole root causes of most of the disturbing phenomena that we see in the region, like uh, extremism, like radicalization, like many other phenomena that no one wants to see rising in our part of the world. This means more vulnerabilities that need to be addressed through a well-structured dialogue, of course. Now, in the post-pandemic horizon, shall we aspire for a social dialogue that would be sensitive also, uh, not just to the short-term deals, if I may call them, but also to sustainable gender-sensitive and gender-balanced value chains that are also eco-friendly? and to be mindful uh, uh, of integration of new technologies in a way respectful to the workplace and the working culture? Shall we aspire for more serial discussion of work-life balance uh, uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic and all the post-dramatic stress that we will all be suffering? Shall social dialogue take into account also global sociocultural mega trends that are affecting uh, uh, the livelihoods of uh, millions of families around the world? Shall we take into consideration the post-truth condition? Shall we think about single person households being the norm in, 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 in the time to come? Increasing connectedness, but decreasing privacy, smart cities, how can we integrate all these mega trends into an effective social dialogue that would take into consideration not only the working conditions, but also the living conditions? Now, will the lessons learned from this pandemic be finally integrated into a post-pandemic recovery scenario, or are we doomed to repeat the same mistakes? I think the time to come ahead of us will show, but more than any other time on the conduct of each depends the fate of all. This is an old wisdom that never gets old, really. 
at the UFM Secretariat, we have mobilized our resources and our capacities since day one. Recently, our engagement with the social partners have yielded the fourth UFM social uh, uh, dialogue forum. And as a concrete follow-up to the recommendations and the takeaways and the actionable ideas coming out from this forum, we are happy to announce that in 2021, we will take some of these recommendations and shed light on them and further emphasize how to turn them around through a workshop organized in collaboration with the European Training Foundation, ETF, with Business Med. And uh, the thematic is not one that we're making up because that would be the idea. We wanted to act upon the recommendations coming out from the forum. And as such, we will be focusing on skill development for an effective social dialogue. All ideas and recommendations are welcome. We're happy to liaise and to work with everyone because it fulfills our role as a regional platform of consensus building on sectoral agendas in the region. And social dialogue ranks high among our priorities. Um, I will be glad to share with you more details as we approach that event. We will definitely keep you all posted. And in all cases, we will be in touch through the coming webinars of Business Med that we're very happy to be part of. I don't want to take more of your time or monopolize this uh, session. So without further ado, again, thank you all very much and looking forward to your insights and your ideas in today's discussions. I'm done with my part. I hope I managed to respect my time slot and I give thank the floor back to the respected moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Razaz. You are always punctual. It is, you have take 10 minutes and 30 seconds only. So you are just on time. Thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, intervention. It was very, uh, uh, very rich in ideas. So uh, we will discuss it at the end of this session. We will have 10 minutes to discuss it. Now we will have our second uh, keynote uh, speech. It is uh, with Mrs. Uh, Renata Harung Daus. She is the Vice President for Europe and Central Asia at the IOE. Uh, and she is the Managing Director of the Confederation of German Employers Association. And uh, Mrs. Renate also has uh, international responsibilities at, uh, uh, at the BDA, and she is always in contact with ILO and the I, uh, OECD and United Nations Organization. And she is also giving some advisory uh, activities and work for international uh, 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 on international issues and uh, other uh, other uh, uh, international framework agreements to several organizations and companies. Uh, Mrs. Renate, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me first of all say um, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. And I would like to uh, use this occasion also to congratulate uh, Barbara Beltrame to her election, unanimous election as president of Business Med. That's fantastic, great. And we really look forward to working with you also uh, with the IOE. So I now speak in my capacity as uh, vice president of the International Organization of Employers. And there, as you know, we have regional vice president and the region I represent is Europe and Central Asia. So it's a great pleasure for me to give the perspective in this um, um, business med dialogue of uh, the European and Central Asian um, region of the employers. Um, let me say, having just finished three weeks of tripartite social dialogue at the global level with the uh, governing body meeting of the International Labour Organization, which ended Saturday evening. Um, it was all virtual, so we were in a way chained to Zoom <laughs> for three weeks. Um, I think it, is, uh, it has shown how important it is to have social dialogue also for um, successful labor market policy and for successful economic policy, actually. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say that the International Organization of Employers, uh, when the 
COVID crisis set in, um, immediately started to uh, get information, to gather information from its member organizations about the national measures taken um, in the context of this COVID crisis. Because one of the main issues we have to look at is how can we make sure that the sort of um, medical, medically inspired measures don't kill the economy completely. Um, and um, we made a very interesting uh, synopsis and we had very interesting discussions about different approaches by governments and parliaments to these measures, some of them being more, how shall I say, poisonous or toxic to the economy than others. But one of the main issues which we need to discuss, and uh, the previous speaker, Mohamed Razas, has already mentioned it, is um, the effect of the sudden breakdown of all uh, supply chains, the global supply chains. Because over the last 30 years, what happened is that companies, even small and medium-sized companies, have uh, developed their um, uh, supply chains or that change their production architecture in a way that it becomes more transnational, transfrontier. They have had more um, uh, supply chains or more contracts, commercial contracts with companies across the borders. And these have suddenly been disrupted as governments out of medical uh, pen, uh, reasons to sort of uh, control the pen, spread of the pandemic, of the virus, uh, closed the borders from one day to the next. And this was a real, real challenge for companies. It has been a real challenge also in the European Union, because as you know, the single market, which means making business in the entire EU across borders without any distinction. That's one of the main pillars of the European Union. And then suddenly we found that companies, um, companies could not, um, well, um, the, the frontiers were closed there as well. And we were faced with huge issues, for instance, for transfrontier workers who live in the border regions and cross the border every day to go to work and to go back home. And there it was a great help that, of course, um, in many activities, but of course not in all activities, in many activities companies could resort to um, uh, home uh, teleworking and uh, so people didn't have to cross the borders, but they could stay at home. Uh, Germany is particularly concerned by this issue because Germany is a country which has uh, borders to seven other countries in the uh, EU. So uh, there were lots of bilateral problems to solve with these cross-border workers and also with the tax issues because <clears throat> as you know, the international tax agreements when you uh, work in one country and in another country, they change depending on the amount of time you work in the different countries. So all these bilateral issues had to be solved and they were huge, um, huge challenges for, for the businesses, for the business continuity. Uh, one of our main uh, challenge was really the business continuity. And um, what we found very helpful in um, the social dialogue at the national level, but also at European level, was that this business continuity is of course also equivalent to employment continuity. And therefore we had a, um, parallel interest with the workers and with the trade unions to support measures that facilitate as much as possible employment and business continuity, even in those sectors which were hard hit uh, by the measures against the pandemic. Now, obviously, one of the sectors is <clears throat> was precisely the manufacturing with the supply chains the, uh, which were disrupted. But uh, the other sectors were all those, or are, still are actually, all those where um, um, in the services you have uh, people coming together, like um, schools, like universities, um, hotels, restaurants, and this sector broke down completely because as you remember, um, uh, hotels and restaurants have been part of the um, uh, um, closures in many countries, actually most countries due to the uh, confinement. 
So our challenge there is uh, jointly with the trade unions, we have managed to get the government to um, agree to um, subsidies for short time work so that companies which had to stop their activities were not obliged to dismiss the workers, but the employment contract stayed, the workers received short time uh, uh, subsidies for short time work, uh, but the companies themselves, and here I speak in particular of uh, uh, sort of independent artists or uh, hoteliers or uh, restaurant um, owners who had to simply, who, well, who went down to zero business activity, um, they had to receive and they did receive money for to safeguard their liquidity because at the same time they have to continue paying their rent, they have to continue paying uh, all sorts of current expenses. And this is a, a kind of discrepancy which uh, needs to be taken care of. Um, what also needs to be taken care of is to see how those sectors which have actually benefited a lot from this, these measures. And that's in particular the IT sector. I mean, take the company we are using, Zoom, as our technological facilitator. When you look at the shares uh, on the financial markets, they have risen by huge amounts. And the question now will be, uh, and it will be a discussion, I think also in the OECD, but in many other contexts, also in the national context, how does the taxation of these companies uh, make sure that they also contribute their fair share and that the burden doesn't rest only on the companies from manufacturing and on the workers um, uh, where, uh, who have been sort of uh, hardly hit and hardest hit by the, um, uh, by the uh, uh, lockdown and the measures against the crisis. And this is um, one point where we have to make sure that on the one hand that the tax income is um, looked at um, in um, this regard, but also that the changes in regulation and the measures which are taken um, do not adversely affect those companies which actually do their activities and which are hiring many people which are employment intensive and which have been hardest hit by this uh, corona crisis. So what I want to, uh, the second point I wanted to make is that um, social dialogue, and this is in particular true for, for the region we are speaking about and um, the countries in the Mediterranean region, social dialogue requires a, a participation which is bottom up. It cannot be ordered from the top. And in order to mobilize bottom-up uh, engagement of companies, but also of workers, the governments have to leave the space and have to make a policy which is conducive to social dialogue. And this means that the social partners, both sides must be able to show to their members that it is useful to negotiate agreements. It is better than not to negotiate agreements. And here, I think we have a big challenge, which is posed by very kind of interventionist policy, because this interventionist policy is either, um, uh, which is not impartial. It is either supporting workers or it is supporting employers. And then you have a kind of prisoner's dilemma because the two sides of the uh, social partners cannot come together because it's one side always says it's better for me to go to the government rather to speak to my social partner. And I think this is something which needs to develop in the, um, uh, in the culture of social dialogue. And um, what I also would like to say is that the social dialogue and, and social partnership should be valued also as a bridge between political decisions, the political level, political regulation, and what we call civil society at large. And when we speak about civil society, um, there is always a kind of mi misunderstanding because people, especially in the United Nations and in the sort of Anglo-American tradition, they mix up social partners with NGOs. But in the European tradition, and I think this is also true for our um, uh, whole region in business med, um, there's a big difference between social partners and NGOs because the social partners are the only ones who actually are mandated and are given uh, the role by, by uh, government regulation or by uh, mandates 
to make agreements, to make collective agreements, which are concluded with a binding effect on their members. So when you make a collective agreement between the representatives of workers and employers, as an employer, now I'm speaking from the employer perspective, you can be sure that this is then respected by all the workers and the trade union will be committed to implementing this agreement. Whereas the big difference with NGOs is, is that they, they are political, they are pressure groups. They cannot take a commitment which they will then implement towards any member because they don't have members which would be bound by their commitments. And uh, that's, uh, it is extremely important in, in the political discussion to make this very, very clear that these roles are very different. So the social partners have a different role compared to NGOs. Obviously also social employer organizations or trade unions, they, they also have a role acting as pro political pressure groups, but that's not, not all of it. When they speak to the government about regulation, about legislation and so on. But the main feature which is makes social dialogue so important is this function that it they, the social partners take commitments, which they then enforce and implement with their own membership so that we have a method, a way to organize labor market, which is closer to the companies, which has a legitimacy and which will also help the governments in implementing their labor market reforms and labor market regulations. And if we can continue to work in this direction, uh, to strengthen this role, it would be very, very good. And the BDA, as you know, is very active and committed through its own members in the regions and through its companies to promote this approach to social dialogue. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Renate. You have raised many questions, many ideas that really we were we were searching for for them to to make a, a clearer picture about this situation, especially. This uh, uh, you make a, a very clear dichotomy between uh, 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 social partners uh, in the social dialogue and the NGO system. That we in the South and East Mediterranean countries we are too much uh, having this burden of NGOs. And some of, uh, if I will take uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, uh, the, Ameri uh, the, the American government and some of the Europeans now they are stressing more on the NGOs in Lebanon to rebuild uh, uh, the situation and which I feel it's a little bit of a dangerous uh, uh, way to uh, reshuffle the situation in Lebanon. I think they should stress more on uh, the social partners, those who can have a real influence on their uh, members, as you have said, and uh, on the situation of the economic and social situation itself in this, this regard. Thank you for this point because it was really a, a very helpful one because this notion of civil society is not uh, civil society, civil society actor, it is not very clear in our minds. Thank you very much. Now we will have some uh, little, uh, we have uh, five. Uh, uh, to seven minutes for discussion, and I want to uh, and uh, uh, and now we have a question where uh, you will see on the screen on your screen, uh, <clears throat> and you will receive this to put some uh, uh, major uh, uh, words that or uh, uh, major uh, major words or major concepts that we have heard during this uh, uh, these two uh, interventions from the keynote. Uh, speakers, so you can do it, and uh, it is also for uh, the participants who are joining us, and they cannot, they can only send their question. I will begin with Mrs. Uh, Barbara uh, uh, Beltram. Mrs. Barbara, from what you have heard from Mr. Uh, Razaz and from Mrs. Uh, Harnung Draus, what can you say in one minute? regarding what are the major ideas that attracted you in this, in what they have said. Uh, we are not hearing you. Barbara, open your mic. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I find very interesting the both of them because they are very, uh, very professional people and they know what they speaking to so uh, 
uh, I, um, I think is exactly what you represent as employment uh, as your company and the discussion you have with your employment and negotiation is a micro dimension. Uh, I think also that is very interesting what uh, um, that there are new kind of job now to, to find out for people for the Mediterranean country. I think that is very interesting. And uh, we need to find out what is, uh, what are exactly that kind of job, I think. That is very, very important. And uh, another thing so that uh, the cooperation also, also the cooperation with, um, with the, all the governments uh, and uh, all the employers and all the association, I think is very important. Actually, I don't have, I, I agree with everything they said. So <laughs> I have, uh, for me, it's fine. Yes, you can. Uh, uh, I, I uh, miss, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mrs. Barbara, for uh, your uh, small intervention. And I will, I will go now to uh, to hear from Mr. Mahrouf. Uh, uh, Mr. Maher, uh, can you please, in in little time, to 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 put some points that you have seen or a question to. Mrs. Uh, Renate or Mr. Razaz? Mr. Maher, Mr. Mahru, I think he is not. Thank you, Sham. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Sham. Uh, and uh, thank you for Business Met as well for organizing uh, 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 this webinar. And uh, uh, actually, what I have uh, followed up out of this, uh, which is uh, still, uh, I think, uh, we have to think for, uh, uh, despite that, we have a lot of efforts that have been uh, uh, spent on, on, on social dialogue, uh, uh, on the efforts, especially from the employer's organization. Uh, but still, I think uh, from my own perspective, let's say that uh, how we can, uh, how we can uh, ease, uh, uh, not the definition, uh, at least uh, how we can ease the concepts, how we can make the concepts of, of social dialogue, uh, uh, they believe in social dialogue uh, uh, for employer organizations, uh, and uh, this is my own opinion. By the way, it's not an uh, uh, it's not an official, uh, or, or uh, it's not uh, the, the 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 chamber of industry that I'm representing here. Uh, but still, some somehow I feel that actually uh, the employer organizations they uh, they commit and they work uh, uh, in social dialogue. Uh, as part of their uh, international relations with part of networking with the with the other uh, uh, governmental and and uh, and em employees uh, uh, or trade unions uh, but uh, uh, how how we can how we can make it uh, attractive attractive concept uh, how we can ease the concept of, of social dialogue and uh, uh, as long as we cannot uh, uh, link it with the uh, Let's say with the uh, uh, with the cost benefit analysis uh, uh, from an employer uh, uh, concerns, uh, it would not uh, make it. Uh, we cannot make it uh, 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 attractive. We cannot make it uh, 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 acceptable. Not acceptable, but uh, we cannot make it attractive. Actually, uh, from an employer organization. So, uh, what what is the tools? Uh, or what kind of, of tools or uh, or or, uh, or incentives that we can put it in the road of the uh, of the employer organizations? Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mahru. And now I can go to Mr. Peter. Mr. Peter, from your from your uh, from your side, how do you think the situation is? As Mrs. Renate and uh, Mr. Razaz uh, uh, put the picture in front of us. Mr. Seidenick, to Peter. I think uh, he is not uh, online or... Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, just a short remark on... Uh, I, 
I have no choice. I must agree to what Renato Hornungdraus said um, concerning social dialogue. Uh, I think there's confusion about the terminology. Social dialogue, in a way, is, I apologize, uh, ladies, is a kind of ladies' handbag. Everything is in it, and you find nothing. There is confusion about it. I fully agree. Social dialogue is first and above all relations between employers and trade unions. And the reason why we need these relations is to solve problems, to overcome conflicts, to negotiate, to agree, to sign an agreement, or to go into a conflict, which is part of social dialogue. The second element, which I think we should take into consideration is that the nature of social dialogues bottom up is fine, but I would all already be very, very happy if we could have a decentralized social dialogue. If I look at the situation mainly in the southern countries of the Mediterranean, the trade unions are very much centralized. Uh, there is not enough space for branch federations to negotiate on their level. Sometimes it's always under the umbrella of the central organization. This does not make trade union, does not make con uh, collective agreements very practical and close to economic reality. So I fully agree on that. Third element, which I would like to underline is there is too much of state intervention into social dialogue. The government is a social partner when it comes to negotiations in the public sector. Tripartism does not mean that governments are heading the social dialogue. They are part of a consultation and there should be equality among uh, the three partners in the tripartite social dialogue. And last remark, I, I agree to the comments made on the role of NGOs. I have high esteem for a lot of NGOs. They are, they are a lively element of civil society, but they are not part of the social dialogue in the classical sense of the term. There should be no mix between NGOs and social dialogue. So I prefer to talk, speak about industrial relations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Peter. And uh, uh, I think Mrs. Renate has uh, something uh, uh, to say. We will hear from you some uh, a conclusion about uh, your, uh, everything we, that has been done. And I want to ask to add a question for you. Do you think the globalization, where is the globalization now in all the COVID effect and all the things? Because maybe we are talking more on national level and maybe on somehow regional level, but maybe national level are more, much more now uh, uh, the impact and the work is on national level now. So in, uh, I will ask you for a one minute and a half to give all your ideas. Thank you. I, I didn't want to make a conclusion, just a, a short comment because um, we, I think we have to be careful not to extrapolate our national traditions onto other countries and other traditions. Um, so uh, the social dialogue um, is, has, of course, different uh, forms, like the bipartite one, which Peter Zeidenek um, has highlighted, is very strong in Germany and the Nordic countries. But we have to, we, we know that in other countries, you take, for instance, Italy or France or, or uh, Spain or Belgium, um, for now speaking about the north of Europe, uh, the northern side of the Mediterranean, uh, the role of the state is much more intertwined with the social partners. Because, for instance, in France, the, the collective agreements tend to be extended erga omnes by the government. Uh, the, in, in Italy, you have tripartite agreements between Confindustria, the trade unions and the government and so on and so on. So this, these are different traditions and they all are rooted in their national socioeconomic tradition. And I think they are all um, good, at just as good. There is not one way to, uh, to, to salvation, so to speak. Um, but um, what I think is important is to make this difference between the social partners and NGOs in the sense of responsibility. And then also to make a difference between the what we call the bipartite form of social partnership, or uh, which is the collective bargaining, what Peter mentioned very much, 
and also and then the tripartite one like in the ILO but also at national levels where um, the social partners and the government interact in different forms but these are all legitimate forms and then when it comes to decentralization I think what's important is that it is bottom up now if you have a very small country it makes little sense to have 10 different regional or sectoral organizations. But if you have a very large country, obviously it does make sense because it's more differentiated. So we really, every country has to find its own way and of developing it. The important point is the legitimacy and the representativeness. Now on the globalization, um, well, for the, at the moment we look at uh, globalization rather in shambles due to uh, the measures which were taken to combat the virus. We hope that this will not last. But I agree with what uh, my previous speaker, Mohamed Al-Assad, has said, that um, the situation will be different and probably companies will organize their production architecture in a different way um, um, so as to be less vulnerable to similar events in the future. But then we just see the uh, a new uh, free trade agreement which has been concluded yesterday in the ASEAN with China and many ASEAN countries, uh, which shows that there is a certain uh, will to restore the global and um, um, economy and the global interchange exchange. And I think that's a real challenge for us to work towards it, but it will certainly not be just a way back to the way before the crisis, but we will have to take into account the experiences companies made uh, with these sudden measures and sudden uh, border closures and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rath Mr. Razzas, uh, I know that uh, you always, uh, uh, you can concentrate your uh, ideas. Uh, in two minutes, please. What do you have to say to finalize, to conclude what our discussion, in our discussion? Thank you very much. I took a note of uh, the question made by Mr. Meher, and I actually have something to, to share because it's an interesting question that we should all actually reflect upon. What could we do? How can we make the concept more attractive? You no, know? And I believe that here there is a need for political agency. And this is exactly what the UFM Secretariat has been trying to do. When you find that there is a declaration by the social partners in the sidelines of a UFM ministerial conference, like is the case actually, it did happen with one of the UFM ministerial conferences on employment and labor, then it is one step forward towards recognizing the important role played by the social partners and the importance of an effective social dialogue to the well-functioning, both economically and socially, of the existing labor markets. Everyone needs to understand that this is a win-win situation because unfortunately for some segments and some decision maker classes, you need to emphasize what's in for them in terms of the political agenda or the diplomatic agenda. And here I'm not speaking only as a UFM Secretariat representative. I speak as an individual. No, I believe that there needs to be a very clear emphasis that this is not a favor, not something extra to walk the extra mile. No, it's something with a very clear and concrete impact for all the parties involved. Actually, the social partners and such as such make life easier for the decision makers if they would be able to unleash the full potential of an effective social dialogue. So in a nutshell, I believe political agency is very important. Raising awareness is very important. Emphasizing the equation being a win-win modality for everyone is crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Razaz. And Can now we will give move you for... a minute just to, question, to, to raise a question that has been uh, actually raised by the conference. And I think it's an important question. They think in Egypt, social dialogue is only perceived as negotiation between trade unions and employers over salaries. So how can we com convince them of them that is much more than that? Indeed, most of the uh, new generation are thinking that social dialogue is just increasing salaries or strike. So, uh, may I say something? Since oh, I'm yes. Egyptian, I happen to be the, the Egyptian, no, <laughs> in in the forum. Of course, uh, Miss Rehab Sultan, I do not represent Egypt. I'm not a diplomat. I come from academia, so I'm not speaking 
with a diplomatic hat or an Egyptian flag in my hand. I speak in general terms. Um, there came a time, uh, Ms. Sultan, a few years ago, before I started working for the Economic Development and Employment Division, when I didn't even understand what social dialogue meant. I thought it was another name for intercultural dialogue, in which you bring people in an agora sort of setting, like in ancient Greece, and have them exchange ideas and views on social issues of importance, like gender, mainstreaming, uh, to the end of the list. So I believe, Ms. Sultan, if you would allow me, there is a need to stress certain concepts that are related not only to the well-functioning economies, but to building resilience in a community, they should be integrated into the curricula early on. I'm not saying that everyone should grow up being an expert in social dialogue, but they should be aware of certain concepts. Like, for example, what do we mean by climate action? What do we mean by social dialogue? What do we mean by creative economy? What do we mean by this and that? If we manage to build this awareness at an early age without getting and delving into further details, I think people would eventually grow up with this sort of awareness that uh, it's more than just employers and employees. It's something that could be bipartite or tripartite, something that would benefit everyone and that concerns us as individuals because we are all employees one way or another. And whether we are on the employer side or the employee side, there is something in it for us. Okay, thank you, Mr. Razat. Uh, <clears throat> can we move now for our second session? It is about ILO policy framework for promoting employment and employability. Uh, our first uh, speaker will be Mr. Sayed Turki. He is a senior advisor for the Federation of Egyptian Industries. He will be talking on behalf of uh, uh, ACT-AMP, uh, ILO Bureau for Employers' uh, activity. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Turkey uh, had a long uh, uh, experience in uh, uh, employers' activity. He worked with uh, 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 many organizations in uh, uh, at the international level, and now uh, uh, he is uh, talking in uh, uh, on behalf of ACT. -AM. Mr. Turkey, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, to represent the Federation of Egyptian Industries in this important webinar. Uh, and may maybe I have a comment because uh, there is a, a question related to social dialogue in Egypt. And as a, I am representing the uh, Federation of Egyptian Industries, the, the official representative of employers in Egypt, um, in fact, I cannot say that this is the only item of negotiation between uh, employers, organizations, and trade unions in Egypt, the salaries. Uh, but I can say it is one of the imp very important items, but it is, it is not limited only to, uh, to the salaries. Sometimes we, we are negotiating about the, uh, the OSH requirements, the, uh, uh, some, something related to the transportation uh, of the staff and the health uh, stuff. So, um, and, and also we have this, uh, this National Council for Social Dialogue uh, since, since two, three years ago, uh, even more. Um, this is, I, I close my remarks. So going back to the, the, the topic of, uh, uh, of my thing, the uh, employer's uh, view uh, about uh, the, uh, the imbalances uh, of the, uh, the, the uh, correcting the labor market imbalances uh, in Egypt at the, the Federation of Egyptian Interests have started in a very early stage a permanent dialogue with the government uh, to present our full support and to ensure a full harmonization between the government initiatives and the private sector reactions. We believe that consultation between government and employers organizations is essential during such pandemic to mitigate the socioeconomic impacts of the crisis and is vital for uh, enforcing a new labor flexible policies and regulations that is up doing business, taking into consideration the implications of the crisis. We found that the informal sector is one of the most affected sector by COVID-19. The private sector has backed the government heavily 
to be able to compensate more than 1 million daily workers who have lost their daily income. Uh, also, we are advocating to ease up the registration procedures and costs to encourage formalization and to facilitate access to finance, uh, offering tax incentives, reduce the number of inspecting authorities, and ease up the exit procedures. We encouraged our members not only to maximize their contribution through CSR activities to reduce the impact of the pandemic, especially uh, in the uh, labor field, but also to synergize these efforts with the other public and private players through a uh, solid channels of social dialogue. Uh, we join a national dialogue on, on the amendments of the new labor law that involves relevant stakeholders. Discussions focused on the amendments needed to achieve balanced legislation that accounts for the rights and responsibilities of employers and workers in not only salaries, in addition to promoting more employment opportunities in the form of decent and sustainable jobs. We believe that uh, law should also target a balance between achieving flexibility in the labor market and security for the labor force. Labor market flexibility results in a more dynamic economy that is more capable of expanding, eventually increasing demand for labor. Also adopting a matching skills approach during the crisis means providing the right skills needed in the labor market while generating the necessary economic dynamism to generate new jobs. Uh, we, are, we are going to implement, in cooperation with the ILO CAIO office, a, an initiative focusing on apprenticeship, apprenticeship. Apprenticeships and the provision of workplace training can help both young people and the unemployed to build links with labor market and gain useful work-related skills. We cannot neglect also the important role of vocational and education training in institutions uh, to, uh, to, to private sector enterprises through institutional frameworks that strengthen their partnerships, support mutual dialogue, and promote the development of the TEVIT system in a way that responds to developments in Egypt's economic sectors. And I will not talk much here in the presence of Renata where German is the, uh, the, the, the strongest uh, country uh, applying these TEVET and vocational training uh, uh, modalities. Uh, we also support, uh, supported policies that aim to create effective employment service uh, to be able to, to respond uh, as, uh, as much as we can uh, to the uh, uh, negative uh, impact of the COVID-19 on the labor market in Egypt. We support the development of an effective labor market information system by prom promoting and unifying the efforts of relevant stakeholders. A, we utilize advances in the field of information technology to support effective matchmaking efforts between job seekers and our members from employers. We are trying to promote the establishment of innovative mechanisms to link students to the private sector institutions. Finally, uh, if we are talking about correcting labor market imbalances and promoting women employability, we are lobbying for incentivized private sector employers to offer women flexible hours, childcare, safe and affordable transportation to ease their commute, to provide women with support in searching for jobs that match their skills, raise awareness of the importance of women education, create understanding and awareness of the law ensuring gender equality in the workplace, including law enforcement, promote labor market reforms, targeting women and provide them with incentives and training to promote entrepreneurship activities, thus improving their participation rate in the labor market. And finally, address lodging and commuting concerns uh, for uh, women and uh, address the shortage of nurses and other uh, bases. Thank you so much. I think we can't hear you. Yeah, you don't have your mic, uh, Hisham. 
Okay, I, sorry. Th thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Turkey, for your intervention and for representing the Egyptians' employer in this uh, uh, webinar. Now we will go to uh, our uh, second uh, 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 intervention in this uh, session. It will be done by uh, uh, on behalf of Actrav. We have Mr. Michael Watt. Uh, Watt. He is a technical officer at ILO. Actrav, and uh, we will have will have their position regarding uh, uh, the uh, the position of Actrav in all this uh, 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 in promoting employment and employability. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Watt uh, uh, will have a, will give us uh, the workers' position on all the issues. Mr. Watt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you very much. I am truly honoured to be uh, part of uh, this, this meeting and to be speaking to you today uh, and uh, representing uh, the Bureau for Workers' Activities um, uh, from, from the Hyatt Quarters here in uh, Geneva. I would um, sort of connect already to some of the most pertinent uh, aspects that were mentioned by the speakers that uh, came before uh, and thank you very much for for very interesting uh, speeches so far and I think some of the points I would like to reiterate uh, firstly as it, everyone is aware I mean we are truly living through uh, exceptional times and are struggling with an unprecedented crisis. Um, the ILO estimations have shown that uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, uh, up to 70% of working hours, which is our proxy uh, for, 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 for working out for unemployment in particular, were lost during the first wave of the pandemic, which is an equivalent of almost 500 million jobs worldwide. We've seen enterprises and workers struggle through lockdown measures, uh, as well as through the implications of the, uh, of the, of the pandemic itself. Uh, and this is, these are all trends, particularly in this region, that are, that are continued to uh, worsen uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, and that's, I think, one of the sort of the crucial aspects of this. So I would like to reiterate that other speakers have said before that not all workers and sectors have been hit uh, equally. And also that we mustn't just look at this particular pandemic in isolation. We know that uh, a lot of the challenges that we see now uh, have already been there before the crisis. Uh, and uh, to some extent, COVID has exacerbated some of the trends and challenges uh, in our labor markets today. Um, many sectors, and uh, Renate Honengas has already mentioned some of them, uh, such as manufacturing, uh, as well as service sectors, tourism and hospitality, had experienced huge supply and demand shocks simultaneously, which to that extent has been quite unprecedented. We heard about already about the changes in uh, supply chains, and we see how uh, enterprises are trying to, to limit risk uh, to, uh, to their over, overexposed supply chains. And uh, from the workers' perspective, we see that it is mostly workers who are, were already in vulnerable situations before that are now those who are uh, suffering the most. And these have already been uh, mentioned as well, workers such as uh, young workers, uh, women in particular, migrant workers, uh, or those in the informal economy uh, were those who have been uh, impacted the most. Um, and secondly, I would like to highlight uh, something that uh, is that uh, workers, uh, have been very much at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19, uh, such as uh, health workers, such as first responders, have been working in, at times, horrendous working conditions uh, in order to, uh, to save lives and support uh, their societies and communities. Uh, and this is something that we will have to address uh, more strongly uh, also throughout uh, subsequent uh, waves of this uh, pandemic. And these are some of the main issues that the ILO has been uh, looking into. And we've been working very hard since the outbreak of the pandemic to support our constituents uh, in that regard. And again, I would like to reiterate that this crisis may not be seen uh, very much uh, you know, in isolation. This is part of the broader trends uh, that we've already seen in the world of work, such as digitalization, globalization, uh, changes in demographics, or uh, uh, changes uh, such as uh, climate change. 
And as such, the ILO has very much tried to use its centenary declaration, which was adopted at the last International Labour Conference in 2019, as the basis for, uh, for our intervention. And this was already uh, strengthened by, uh, the, uh, by our constituents during the Global Summit in uh, July. And indeed, it is uh, my pleasure as well to uh, to, to listen today to uh, Mrs. Renate Honungas, who was the spokesperson of the employers group uh, during those discussions. And uh, indeed, there were, there were very uh, interesting discussions that led to this particular document. And this is of the key aspects of this declaration I would like to highlight, which should be at the basis of any given uh, crisis intervention. So, um, governments, employers and workers representatives together made a political commitment to, and I quote, social dialogue, including collective bargaining, tripartite cooperation, which contributes to the overall cohesion of societies and is crucial for the well-functioning and productive economy, and provide an essential foundation for all ILO action and contribute to successful policy and decision-making in its member states. And again, uh, I would like to highlight as well the point that was made earlier that this is very much, uh, you know, relates to both bipartite and tripartite social dialogue in uh, with regard uh, in linking to our social partners. Uh, crucially, and this is another point which is of key concerns to workers, is that the Centenary Declaration makes a link between workers' rights and inclusive and sustainable growth, um, which is a key aspect uh, of uh, that should be a part of this uh, this recovery. They, it makes further uh, a key notion to focusing on freedom of association and the effective recognition of the rights to collective bargaining and enabling rights. This should be at the heart of any intervention, both at national, regional, and international level for this particular uh, crisis. Because as I've said before, and that word has been said before, it is those workers who were even before the crisis, most vulnerable who are now those who are suffering the most. For example, young workers who have seen high levels of unemployment or have been already employed to a large extent in the informal economy or in precarious employment relationships that have uh, borne the, the largest brunt of this, uh, of this uh, pandemic. Uh, they've also had somewhat of a dual impact as they've also already seen the education institutions um, and the general lack of decent employment opportunities uh, in their respective countries as a prohibitor for uh, uh, enjoining uh, productive employment. And this is a huge concern since we know also from past crises how uh, a reduction in years of schooling uh, or the uh, prolonged unemployment at such an age has severe impact of employability and as well of earning capabilities uh, in the future. So fiscal policies are key, particularly that target groups in vulnerable situations. I want to mention here as an example, the EU Youth Guarantee, for example, which uh, uh, should be strengthened in that regard. However, it is important that we do not look this as a means to create more employment as such, but we need to have a greater emphasis on uh, the quality of jobs as well. We need to have more macro and industrial policies at national level to create more employment opportunities since even before the crisis, uh, this was uh, not always the case with large incidents of uh, jobless growth and even deindustrialization uh, in some countries. We need greater investment in labor intensive sectors, in public investment programs, and in the investment of the green economy, digital tool infrastructure, uh, which is crucial in order to provide job opportunities for those who need it uh, the most. We are well aware that many countries are already implementing fiscal stimulus packages, also in accordance and in uh, close collaboration uh, with the social partners. However, given that this pandemic is ongoing, that we may not see a world that we saw in 2019, even after, we've, after this uh, pandemic, and uh, that these uh, fiscal policies uh, need to be strengthened and uh, built on uh, in the future. Past crises have shown us very strongly that there is no guarantee that those who have been affected most by this crisis also those who are, will be benefited from the subsequent policy. So it up, is up to all of us, to the governments, to workers uh, representatives and employers representatives to make sure that these are uh, um, looked after. 
you know, we otherwise we do uh, run the risk of having, particularly in the case of young workers, uh, of creating a quote unquote lockdown generation and the implications for future livelihoods and earning capabilities are severe. Therefore, one of the key priorities is to tackle the growing precarity in labor markets and strengthen in particular the employment relationship in that regard. And again, I would like to quote the centenary declaration here. Since all constituents have made a political commitment to, and I quote, strengthening the institutions of work to ensure adequate protection of all workers and reaffirming the continued relevance of the employment relationship as a means of providing certainty and legal protection for workers. To that end, incorporating social partners and workers and employers organizations in the design and implementations of COVID-19 related policies is of crucial importance. Building confidence through trust and dialogue is crucial to make policy measures effective. We know, and this is already something that uh, was mentioned with some great examples, that those countries who do engage in social dialogue for crisis response are those which uh, result in policies which are strong, consensus-driven, uh, and ensure that they serve those who need them the most. And with this, I would like uh, to, to make my final point. We live in a truly globalized world. We have challenges that go beyond COVID, such as the imminent threat of climate change. And all of these will require a truly global response. How we foster multilateralism, how we achieve the sustainable development goals in this decade of action will require a complete buy-in of all, including workers' representatives, uh, employers' representatives, and uh, governments at national level. Um, with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the answering discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Watt. It was very, a very important uh, uh, intervention uh, done by uh, Aktrav, and uh, we have now uh, the other way, the other pers uh, another way to see and uh, to have the uh, to see the perspective of the problem. I will begin now. We have ten minutes. We will have uh, uh, we will raise some questions and we will uh, discuss the issues that uh, were between. We, we, we have uh, heard now. And I will begin with Mrs. Dono, Donoris uh, Bonici. She is the president of uh, Malta Employers Organization and she is an employer herself. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Bonici, please, I want to, uh, to hear from you uh, an employer's perspective of the problem, of <coughs> the social dialogue, and how social dialogue can be used to uh, facilitate and to reduce the impact of COVID, of the economic crisis, and everything we are uh, uh, just uh, seeing in the economic arena in this period. The floor is okay. Bonici. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I uh, must ma uh, make uh, a very good comment, if, if I may that in Malta we do enjoy uh, a very good and sound uh, social dialogue practice. Um, if you had gone maybe 20 years ago, the idea about unions and also employers, the, it would be like uh, a, a fighting confrontations. But at this day and age, we have learned to collaborate and also to uh, meet on the social dialogue uh, unit, which is the MCESD in Malta. Um, we have, um, by collaboration, we have sat down and seen each other's sides of the, the uh, quotation. And what one wants, the other one will, will discuss and assess the outcome of the effects on the employers or, or on the workers. Um, we also have the input of the civil uh, society at our social group. However, uh, in this day and age uh, today, we, we are still getting, um, Renata mentioned how important it is for the equality to feel equal when, when you meet. Uh, when you meet the government as a social partner as well. Um, 
we are a bit overpowered in Malta with the the social approach, uh, social dialogue approach as regards to the government, in the sense that sometimes we have programs or we have uh, items to discuss, and these are hijacked by a government need to discuss an urgent, for example, subject. Um, this, of course, we we uh, sometimes have to. <laughs> Um, surrender to it because it, it can be uh, um, something very, very uh, urgent. And also, um, we eventually come to a sort of a compromise. There are still issues which bother us in the sense that uh, um, if the government decides to place something, um, uh, as we say, okay escaping the social dialogue, it is either entered at election time in the, in the political manifesto, or it is done as a political promise. And this we do not agree with, and we, not, we do not encourage, and we oppose. Because uh, if you include it in a political manifesto, they will have the best excuse to say, no, it must be done because it was a political promise. And of course, political promises are done for vote rigging. So I'm being very blunt here. This is this is the uh, sort of little knickknacks that that are still bothering us. But besides that, in Malta, social dialogue is very very healthy. The unions have uh, the, the the workers' unions have all come together and they are all represented at this the social dialogue uh, unit and also the employers bodies there is some there is someone who he, who has his for his micro opening and we are listening to some interruption somewhere i cannot hear it so um with with our background and the, the the social dialogue at present, I can say that yes, it can improve. It can improve a lot because um, like, like it was said before, the NGOs who are uh, quite uh, uh, not to be, not to be uh, neglected sort of, they all fall into more or less the civil society uh, part of, of our social dialogue. However, they, they can sometimes be very strong, especially in the climate change issue. And uh, in Malta, we have also the civil issue of the rule of law, which was very much challenged uh, lately. Uh, we are still wanting uh, more justice and, and more establishment of the rule of law and good governance. And uh, this is something that we all the social partners agree upon, and we still insist about certain issues that really have to be dealt with. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bonici, for this uh, intervention, and it shed light on uh, some uh, something that is going on in uh, Malta, and uh, we can see it now from Mr. Mahru' perspective. What is going on in? Uh, in Jordan, Mr. Mahru, if we, I want to ask you on the level of employment and employability, and uh, in two minutes, please, uh, Mr. Mahru. Uh, sure, Hisham. Thank you very much again. And uh, for the concerns of, of unemployment in Jordan, uh, as you know, that uh, uh, the needs for, for social dialogue is quite important as long as we know and if we agree. Uh, as a tribal type for the uh, role of uh, uh, of social dialogue in absorbing uh, the unemployed people or a, a portion of the unemployed people. And uh, actually the, the problem of unemployment is becoming deeper uh, through the, the crisis of, of COVID or the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, that leads to increase the unemployment rate from 18% uh, to 23.1%. Uh, through the first six months of 2020 and uh, the official expectations. And this is the official statistics actually shows, uh, shows this, this number. Uh, the, the official expectations for the unemployment to reach 25% uh, uh, by the end of this year. Uh, I think uh, this is a quite a major 
uh, a major uh, obstacle that facing uh, the national economy and uh, uh, the belief in social dialogue i think is a is a is a major concern uh, uh, the, the 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 government and i do agree actually with the points that have been raised by dr razaz when he mentioned that the government agency uh, because beliefs itself would, it would not be enough actually uh, to help uh, in, in, in absorbing uh, or, or uh, in executing the recommendations that comes uh, that comes out of, of the social uh, dialogue uh, because we have several attempts and I think uh, in the third session I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, share with you uh, our our expertise in this field uh, uh, specifically in the solid uh, project that have been executed uh, within uh, uh, within business med or with business med uh, so uh, uh, and we we have we have thought that uh, the, the the generally uh, uh, again uh, social dialogue itself uh, would not help actually uh, uh, as long as it's uh, it's it's not a quite a comprehensive uh, dialogue uh, this is uh, uh, this is what we have seen during the last few years uh, we have a good experience uh, here and there in social dialogue uh, but as long as it's not a comprehensive uh, there is no an official commitment from uh, the, the parties or the tripartite or whom they are sitting on the table uh, to, to, to execute the outcomes or the recommendations, uh, I think, and, uh, and to affect at the level of general policies, it would not actually uh, create the, the, the looking or the impact that we are looking for uh, out of social dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahro. Uh, Mrs. Renate, uh, please, uh, can you in two minutes uh, 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 give us uh, some ideas or the general ideas of ACTAMP and because I know that IOE and ACTAMP are working together on some issues. Can you in two minutes please, yani I, am, <clears throat> I will give you these two minutes because uh, we don't have too much time. Can you in two minutes please uh, 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 summarize for us the position of IOE and ACTAMP on the issues we are, we are uh, discussing? Yes. Very happy. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, actually, I'm uh, very pleased to hear that uh, Michael, our colleague from ACTRAF, has uh, mentioned the Centenary Declaration, uh, because uh, our colleague, uh, El Sayed Torki, was a member of the committee, of the conference committee, which negotiated this declaration, and I was the employer negotiator for, for the employers group, and we had a very intense debate and uh, actually, I'm, I'm very pleased that we managed to get a very concrete outcome. And this was one year before the pandemic measures actually set in. And we now find that uh, the recommendations we made in this centenary declaration are precisely the ones which need to be implemented now. And um, when I look at ACTEMP, um, it is about helping um, let me put it that way. First of all, centenary declaration. What is really important in the centenary declaration is that it really it focuses on the three levels, on the level, on the global level. What can the ILO do to help the national constituents? Second level, what should member states and governments at national level do? to um, develop the principles of the ILO of decent work. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I think we all know the decent work concept, uh, combat informality, make sure the economy develops well, the uh, workers have good working conditions and we progress in this regard and social, um, social uh, inequality is combated and so on. Um, and the third um, pillar, so to speak, is what can the social partners do to uh, promote this? And um, if I now go to the concrete actions of the um, ACTEMP now during the crisis, um, it has focused its work and it has, it has just published an important uh, guide for employer and business organizations to help them um, re um, help uh, provide services to their members um, in the times of the COVID crisis. And this is very, very concrete because it is based on information and input from the different uh, member organizations, from the different employer organizations. 
and it helps organizations to get an, a glimpse of what other countries are doing, social partners in other countries are doing, and to get some inspiration for their own national context. And if I may come back to one of the uh, remarks you made um, at the very beginning, I think the issue of social partners really making sure that they get a basis, a bottom-up basis, they get the interest of member of, of companies. Uh, one question in the chat was about SMEs. Um, um, the a very, very important how to make sure that business organizations can actually help SMEs, that they can deliver a added value to SMEs, even help uh, small entrepreneurs get out of informality and um, get into the formal part of the economy. Now, this is obviously issue a link uh, to political advocacy, facilitating making regulation less cumbersome, but it is also about helping companies, helping entrepreneurs to um, get into the regulated sector. And, and all this is part of uh, this guide which ACTEMP has been producing. And um, I think that's very, very useful and colleagues should really be um, encouraged to contact ACTEMP and to get hold of this guide <coughs> um, and to, to discuss this um, in, in the sense of um, strengthening this type of organization. And just to come back, you, you are absolutely right. Uh, the NGOs very often are kind of nicely packaged organizations which sometimes are financed by very specific interests or government or, or um, even business interests. We should be careful not to fall into the trap and also to warn our governments to really resist and, and insist on um, dealing and consulting the real representative local employer organizations. It's not about some kind of NGO flying in from wherever, um, but um, it's about the real local business community which needs to be supported in a bottom-up way. And that's what ACTEM can help organizations doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Renate. Mr. Watt, you have two minutes because I had many uh, employers who, uh, who, who are in front of you. I want you in, in two minutes, so uh, in two minutes to uh, maybe if Mrs. Barbara, do you have something to say if uh, you open your ears. If you, yeah, if there are some questions for the other, for the other participants, otherwise I can make the conclusion if you want. Uh, we we can we, we can leave the conclusion. I will leave the conclusion for Mr. Watt. If you want to conclude something about the employers, I will give you the floor uh, now for one minute, please. Okay, I, will, I try to be very very quick. Yes. First, uh, I would like to thank you for this very interesting uh, debate. For my uh, for my side, I'm very I representative employer as a representative of Confindustri and businessmen, but I'm also an employer with the company that I run. I think whatever in Europe, our South Mediterranean region, we need to move forward to find solution for our small medium enterprise and job lost during the period of a pandemic. Most of this crisis of COVID-19 has changed the deal. We have to work in synergy with the trade union and raise our voice to the government in order to continue to have this bilateral dialogue. We must, uh, we must work hands in hands to find better solution to resolve this social and ec economic crisis, particularly that is touching all over the world. And for that, the best solution we think is the dialogue. Our role is very important as social partners, and I'm looking forward to working with you on the Solid2 project, in particular with the ILO ILO, with more debate, uh, debates and concrete solutions and change of best practice for each country. And hopefully it will be a post-COVID pandemic period and we could uh, cover and resolve some regional impact on what COVID left our small medium enterprise, employment and employability, and partly 
particularly of uh, younger women jobs as a bigger challenge that we have to face this year. Moreover, with this new normal of digitalization world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Barbara. Uh, Mr. Watt, uh, I, have, I have built a well employer front in front of you. So uh, uh, you have now uh, to conclude this session in two minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that is very kind. I do not see. I do not see it as a front. I'd rather see it as a dialogue. I think that's. Uh, I've seen uh, very interesting uh, contributions so far, and uh, I mean, there's. It just shows as well the the overlaps that a crisis brings in terms, and that in, in for that sense, the the importance of uh, social dialogue. I think there was also a question in the chat about whether uh, the crisis will uh, bring back social dialogue or be a hindrance to that, and whether it will only focus then on, on, on certain issues such as employment stability and income. And again, I think we see, we see multiple trends and we see, I, for, first of all, I do not think that, uh, that the crisis uh, will, will revert back to, to social dialogue or collective bargaining on, on the basis of, of income only, quite the opposite. I think it has showcased the, the, the scope and the necessity to, to discuss both at bipartite and tripartite level various, various issues that come with the changing landscapes in, in labour markets. I mean, teleworking, for example, is a, is a classic example. We see more and more collective agreements, particularly at the European level, uh, Level, also at sectoral level that include more and more incidences on, on issues around working time, for example. So I think the crisis is, is a huge opportunity for, for uh, expanding the notion that has been presented here of what bipartite and tripartite social dialogue is. Uh, I think there is a growing importance for that. However, to what extent that will be implemented, I think we've seen around the world, not just in this region, then various different uh, examples. I think we've seen, uh, we've seen great examples where countries have truly incorporated uh, through various uh, different bodies on crisis response, their social partners. However, we've seen incidences in countries where it has actually infringed uh, fringe labor rights, where it has infringed uh, social dialogue to a certain extent. So I think the point we would have to make from the ILO is very much that this should be part and parcel. And of course, uh, Mrs. Honogdas uh, is, is right in saying I've been a little bit lofty in quoting, you know, some of the global paragraphs of the of the of the declaration, which is a political declaration, which is completely right that this is now the blueprint for concerted action from the ILO and its constituents at national level. Uh, it will be part and parcel of our work going forward. And uh, you, uh, Mr. Honoglas, you're much more aware than I am through, through our GB discussions, how this has shaped uh, our ongoing work on, on, on these uh, issues. Uh, and I think that will, uh, uh, that will sort of be, be, be the important uh, aspect going on. The, work, the, the office is working strongly at national level and ACTRAV, of course, uh, as well. We've similarly to ACTEM, have been uh, very strongly engaged with, with, with our constituents and provide a lot of uh, input and uh, information for, for particularly for workers' organizations of how to, how to react. Because there is a need, I think, to highlight the important work that the social partners have already done, both employers and workers' organizations, have worked very hard over the last few months uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, support for, for, for their, their members. And I think there's, there's a lot of scope for that. And uh, with that, I wish you all the best for the uh, ongoing discussions, uh, and thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thank you, Mr. Watt. Now we will move for uh, the session, uh, the last session before we will have the session of interactive uh, session question and A. We will have now uh, uh, the session uh, entitled Promoting Employment and Employability Through Social Dialogue Between Employers and Trade Union uh, Organization. It is a case study session on uh, the solid uh, project. Unfortunately, Mr. Mustafa Tlele did not uh, appear. Hopefully that he has nothing and he is in good uh, hands, uh, but we try to, to get in touch with him. Uh, 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 hope that Mr. Tlele uh, 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 
we will uh, uh, because he is not here so i am a little bit uh, worried about uh, mr clearly why he is not uh, he did not join us uh, uh, in this way i will give the floor for mr peter sidening peter sidening was a uh, he was involved in a solid project and uh, uh, he worked on action uh, uh, on an action with quadri-party dialogue between Utica, UGTP, DGB, and BDA. And he has, he can exchange uh, with us his, uh, the best practices done during the project, the solid one. And uh, he did a study on Euromat social dialogue. So uh, Mr. Seidening, I will give you the floor. You have uh, the same time that I, we will give to Mr. Clearly, it is up to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Seidening, you have, the floor is yours. Hisham, I think that uh, Peter Pe left. Peter also uh, left? Yes, but it's fine. Uh, uh, Muhammad okay. is here. Okay, so can you, Jihad, 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 yes, I will give you, I will give you, I will give you the floor. Uh, please. I think go with Muhammad. I, as you are here, Muhammad, you know, solid uh, better than anyone. Uh, by Dolores. Okay. Uh, so solid project, uh, first phase was a, a first project on the, on the region on social dialogue when i say on the region it was it was uh, with the three countries as an example it was tunisia morocco and jordan and now we will move to solid two phase uh, with the tunisia morocco jordan but we'll also add palestine uh, algeria and um, uh, Morocco, I think I forgot Morocco. Lebanon. So there will be six uh, South Mediterranean countries, but we also have our uh, partners in uh, Europe uh, for in terms of exchange of know-how. And we worked closely for Solid One with the, uh, Germany and uh, Italy. And for it, uh, Solid Two, we work closely with Business Europe and European Trade Union to uh, take some uh, European countries as per uh, da uh, Danish or uh, Norwegian that have more experience and uh, social dialogue within the region. And we are planning to uh, continue on what we did on Solid One. And in Solid One, we had uh, uh, social partners, of course, which is trade union and employers uh, from both sides. And also we added a component, as uh, Renate said, it was civil society. It was not a social dialogue directly, it was a civic dialogue because most of the social partners uh, don't want to involve the, the social uh, civil society. So we use the word civic dialogue. So we had all the stakeholders on uh, SOLID and uh, at the first, the beginning of the project, we worked uh, bilaterally with the country by country. And then we had meetings, uh, trade unions with um, employers from all the countries. And then we uh, introduced a component of civil society. At the end, we have signed uh, an, a, a charter of uh, 12 components, and most of the charter, it's not crisis or increase of salary. So we try to not to work on the subject that will make everyone uh, disagree during the meetings. So we raised the important subject as uh, the, the employment, as uh, women rights, as uh, the SDGs. Uh, we worked on most of the SDGs actually, and the charter was with 12 points. And uh, actually it was closely with the ILO uh, conventions. Uh, and we signed this um, charter, and this is important to say that uh, we did not involve government at the beginning but we want to raise our voice to the governments. And at the end, the ministers of these three countries signed the, the, the charter and we expect to have the same result for SOLID 2. Uh, nevertheless, the SOLID 2 will start with these three countries with already uh, moved on in terms of the charter implementation. But so the, the project name is promotion of social dialogue. That is important to say because most of these countries don't know what is social dialogue. And uh, we are not all, I mean, it's not easy. We are not experts of social dialogue. Uh, I mean, com particularly uh, when you see in the South Mediterranean region, the youth, they're not uh, aware that social dialogue is covering all these areas. 
And sometimes I can say to myself, I've been to a meeting with uh, more than 200 men and I'll be, I was the only woman involved in this meeting. And that was impressive because usually uh, they discuss their own right of the women. So, uh, and the employment right of the women, maternity leave, this kind of things. And you say, why the women are not involved in this dialogue? Why the youth are not involved? So what we try to do on the SOLID project is to promote the information, what is exactly social dialogue and what social dialogue involves. And when you see now most of the meetings on uh, social economy, on CSR, on uh, women in uh, empowerment, all of this returns to the decision made by the government in terms of social dialogue. The problem is that we uh, saw the difference between uh, Europe social dialogue and South Mediterranean social dialogue. And as an experience, we bring all these partners to the social dialogue uh, based in Belgium. Uh, it was our partner CNT Belge, which involved Business Europe and European Trade Union. And both organizations bring their voices, and then some of the laws and collective goes to the parliament, to the European parliament directly. And these laws are implemented in all Europe, something that we don't have in South Mediterranean region. And this is important. That's why we want to involve our partner as UFM, as representative of the Euromed region, and to work on kind of platform of debate, of discussion in the future, uh, thanks to SOLID project, in order to, uh, to try to have this kind of uh, dialogue platform for our members and bring some recommendations. So I'll leave the floor maybe to Mohammed, maybe if he, you have more information on that and maybe talk about the ministerial. Yes, maybe, maybe Mohammed, you can a little bit, uh, uh, I won't, I mean, you can uh, say whatever you want, it's the floor is yours, but uh, uh, you have raised in your first uh, intervention something about the political issue about social dialogue and how social dialogue could be, could be a real tool in the, the situation the world is facing now and we are facing in the South Mediterranean country. And as uh, uh, Jihan said, the problem that they do not understand what is social dialogue. I and mean, social dialogue in the mind of people is not well defined. And also Mrs. Uh, Renate spoke about social dialogue in a way that maybe we have, what is the experience? What do you have to say? Just two seconds, uh, Hisham, I, I, we would say uh, bye to our president. She has to leave, she has another meeting. Thank you, uh, president. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Barbara. For joining us today. It, it was nice meeting you. Thank you very you. much. Please, we want from you, I will interrupt, and I want from you two minutes as you oh, are no. concluding. Yes, 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 we want two minutes she, from she her. She gave her conclusion. She I already said it before. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry, okay, <laughs> thank you. Have, have thank a nice day. Bye. Bye bye. Mr. Razaz. Thank you very much. I will again stress the need for agency. There is a need for political agency. There is a need for this to be really given the forefront of the political discussion. And I think the best way to do this is through ministerial conferences and through ministerial declarations or even joint statements. And as such, it was fantastic to see how the UFM ministers in some of their ministerial declarations stressed the need for an effective social dialogue as a means to building resilient labor markets. And now in the wake of the COVID, I do foresee also in the coming UFM ministerial conference on employment and labor, we are yet to see when it will take place. Um, I imagine that social dialogue would be also one of the key areas touched upon by the ministers. And it would be fantastic if there would be yet another mandate or a clear indication on what needs to be done in concrete terms to further promote this file. From our side, uh, and now I'm not talking as a decision-making uh, authority uh, of any uh, sort, from our side, uh, we view the SOLID project not only as a, a pioneering initiative, it's actually a groundbreaking initiative, not only because of the importance of social dialogue, but also because of the importance of the South-South dimension. This is one of the least unleashed potentials in the region. 
and it's a huge potential. And if we talk about something like, just to give you an idea of how fragmented the region is economically speaking, unfortunately, of all the trade flows, just to give you an example, taking place in the Euro-Mediterranean region, 90% are confined within the European Union, another 9% between the EU and its southern and eastern UFM neighbors, and only 1% between the southern and eastern UFM countries. This is wasted potential, but also a massive opportunity the way we see it. And when we have an initiative like SOLID, which not only promotes something as important as social dialogue, but also emphasizes this South-South collaboration and hopefully would lead to some sort, I will not say convergence of policies, but at least a sort of understanding and consensus building and mentalization, mindfulness of how important this is for building back resilience, then definitely we can only give it 100% from our side. I hope I made it clear and I hope I managed to re-emphasize the support that we want to give to our social partners and that we give to the SOLID project. We very much look forward to the second phase and what it can achieve and what we can bring into the table in terms of organizational and institutional support. Okay, thank you, Mr. Razaz. Now I will give the floor for Mr. Mahro. He is the Director General of the Jordan Chamber of Industry. And Mr. Mahro uh, has a, a big experience in more than 10 years as consultant in the field of economic management and SMEs uh, uh, for different national, regional, and international institutions. Uh, Mr. Mahrou, the floor is yours to give us uh, uh, your, uh, the case study uh, that happened is with SOLID in Jordan and what do you have to say about it? Thank you very much again, uh, Hisham, and uh, for the business meet as well. And uh, it's worth to mention that uh, and to repeat actually, uh, and to thank uh, uh, Jihan and her team as well for uh, for the huge work that have been spent during the first time of our cooperation uh, on SOLID program that was started in 2016. Uh, and uh, I, I hear, uh, just I would like to highlight that uh, the SOLID project was uh, uh, honestly and frankly speaking that uh, the only and that was the first pilot project that we had uh, uh, to work through uh, social dialogue uh, from, from let's say we have started it from scratch. Uh, we have started the concepts of, of social dialogue. It was not only a workshop, it was not only a training course. It was a quite a comprehensive project that went through the organizations uh, with the tripartite uh, 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 or with the, with the three parties actually, uh, step by step. Uh, and it was uh, initiated uh, uh, in, in, in a good manner, in a, in a good perspective uh, from, and uh, uh, again, but uh, I think uh, when we reach a certain point, and I'm here talking specifically about uh, Jordan, uh, when we're reaching a certain point, when you have a different minister, uh, somehow you have a different visions. Uh, and uh, why is these visions actually is quite changing, despite that we are talking about a general uh, concept uh, that is quite uh, benefited uh, the three parties, uh, of the of the of the of the social dialogue, and uh, it's for sure for the benefit of three parties, uh, which is the, the uh, which is known for everybody. Uh, uh, here is the here is the problem. Uh, I don't know how we cannot actually uh, utilize the uh, uh, or why we are not able to continue uh, uh, following or working uh, on the whole uh, steps and uh, uh, procedures of social dialogue uh, for the benefit of everybody. Uh, why we stopped at a certain point, I don't know. Uh, is this refer back to the level of awareness? Uh, is it uh, is it belong to the uh, to a certain level of of, of action? Some issues related to policies, governmental policies, um, uh, and uh, this is what what I do believe actually from my my point of view. Uh, uh, and uh, imagine that uh, the SOLID program that, uh, as I mentioned, was the only full-fledged full uh, uh, project uh, for a social dialogue. And it opens for us, actually, uh, as a JCI, it opens the doors uh, for us to cooperate and to work with other uh, organizations, uh, uh, mainly with the, our, our counterpart in Denmark, uh, DI, Danish Industrial Confederation, uh, to continue working on social dialogue. And we have worked with them 
uh, to continue uh, uh, working on, on this. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the question is, is clearly, uh, I would like it to, 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 to put it uh, this way. Uh, is the, the social dialogue, or this is what I found, this is what I, I came up with. Uh, the social dialogue is, uh, is accepted as long as it, it's, it's in line with, with our benefits and, uh, and needs. And uh, uh, once uh, it becomes against each other's, uh, I have to stop and to rethink of some other approaches. And this role is played not only actually by, by the government, it could be played by employers or by trade unions as well. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, I find it, uh, the case somehow. Uh, uh, and uh, what we are looking for, uh, this, is, uh, this is only as a, as a, as a final or, or as a recommendation uh, for anyone who's like to work for a social dialogue at the longer term, uh, all of us will be benefited and all of us will, will get benefits out of this so social dialogue. Uh, but uh, in the short term, it could be for the benefit of X or Y or Z. It doesn't matter at the short term. Yani it's not necessarily to be a winner for the, all, all, all of the steps of, of social dialogue. Uh, but finally, or at the end of the day, or the final conclusions, at the, especially when we went to the policy uh, uh, issues or the dialogue regarding the uh, the policy, public policy issues, I think the benefit, uh, all of us will be uh, benefited. Uh, but again, uh, the beliefs in, in, in social dialogue, actually it could be the major uh, obstacle that facing uh, the, the, to, continue, uh, uh, to continue working or to continue doing uh, some kind of, of social dialogue or a civic uh, dialogue, even uh, to include uh, the, the, the uh, uh, social or to, to include uh, the NGOs uh, within uh, the social uh, dialogue. Uh, I think the, the, the major impact of, of, of SOLID that now uh, nowadays that we felt it actually during the pandemic as well, and we have to admit that uh, it gives us uh, that, uh, which is called, uh, now in Jordan we are working under, which is called the defense law, uh, which is, uh, gives the cabinet uh, the rights uh, to stop and to, to, uh, to uh, 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 which is uh, to stop all of the laws, whether labor law, any laws, they are able to stop all of the laws existing in the in the country uh, and to to follow their procedures and their uh, announcements uh, according to the uh, to the pandemic situation. Uh, but I think the the practice that we had uh, with the with the solid it gives us uh, a space uh, uh, to maneuver actually and to work with the government. Uh, to reduce the level of the impact and the impact of the of the the defense law that they are following and they are implementing right now uh, it helped us somehow uh, but still i think we we do believe that uh, it depends on the government uh, because uh, you know that uh, uh, for example during the last 10 years you just mentioned the that i'm, I'm jci since uh, nine, 2010 uh, i have worked with 11 minister of labors uh, during the last 10 years which means that I'm worked with a with a with a with a minister in, in a list in a few months. I, I say uh, uh, this actually gives you in a position you are not able to keep convincing and to keep uh, any uh, 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 buying uh, the same support from each government from each minister uh, for the uh, for the uh, the social uh, dialogue. So I think we have in the in the uh, phase two of, of solid. Uh, I would recommend actually if we can come up with a with a something how we can make it uh, not necessarily institutionalized, but uh, somehow uh, to be organized, to be officialized, uh, to be uh, uh, to 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 make the social dialogue uh, 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 to to went through the whole governments. It's not related to the to the minister uh, or the minister who signed the declaration or the one who attend uh, the the first. Uh, or, uh, or releasing uh, or, or the first opening session of the project that was in Jordan, for example. And when he left, uh, uh, all of the things have been evaporated somehow. You don't know why. And uh, if you don't have uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, tripartite, I think social dialogue effects is going to be quite, uh, 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 quite difficult. And uh, for having, uh, for having uh, 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 negotiations or a social dialogue with the trade unions uh, only, uh, I think it would not uh, it would not work with a, with a governmental coverage because I think uh, we are still not in the same page 
uh, of understanding the social dialogue with the trade unions. So uh, the, the, the attendance and the, the, the existence of the government as a major partner on a social dialogue is quite important and it's a very uh, important to have them. Uh, and I think we have to think of the second phase, how we can make uh, the social dialogue uh, much more official somehow. I don't know if it's the right word that I mentioned. Uh, if we can uh, make it uh, institutionalized somehow, uh, it doesn't matter who's the minister or to which ministry uh, belongs. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mahrou. Uh, as uh, many of our colleagues have left for uh, other uh, uh, activities they have, uh, I will begin with a simple question that it was raised to us regarding SMEs. Social dialogue and SMEs, what next after the pandemic? How can social dialogue help SMEs to overcome the crisis? This is a question that was raised by a, a participant and I want from uh, Jihan, Mr. Mahrou, uh, uh, Mrs. Renate to answer this question. How can social dialogue help SMEs. And we know that in the Mediterranean basin and in the South Mediterranean and the East Mediterranean, SMEs form up to 90% of the economic activities. Please, Mrs. Uh, Butiba. Uh, so I will start by answering a little bit to uh, the, some question that uh, Dr. Meher is uh, asking. Indeed, uh, uh, Solid Project is uh, it's a kind of example. Uh, it's not a project, actually. We don't have to take it as a project, but it's the only platform we have as regional to exchange know-how between each country and particularly for South countries. And indeed, most of our governments did not follow uh, what the social partners are raising and uh, they signed some uh, declaration by their own and then we discover as companies or as workers that there is new laws that we don't know about it and that our government has signed and this completely pity but we try to work on this uh, solid uh, in order to raise our voice within the government and of course uh, uh, it will be with the help of some experience and as uh, Dr. Meh has said DI will be involved in our future uh, uh, discussion uh, as a platform and then uh, of course uh, Jordan is also involved and you will have the opportunity uh, to raise your voice for the government as we will be uh, directly working in partnership with the uh, UFM and in that sense they have no other choice as UFM is governmental so uh, that's why we are uh, having these uh, webinars uh, and will be more other webinars in order to uh, in partnership with UFM in order to raise our voice having solid or not having solid this will be it's just a tool but it's an occasion to have all the south partners uh, with uh, confronted to their governments so to answer your question uh, and the question of the panelists in terms of SMEs, social dialogue is uh, most then important because without um, discussion, without raising the, the voice of trade unions and the companies and the disasters we are passing through uh, this period of pandemic, uh, I think that most of the companies are closing. Maybe in the South uh, Mediterranean countries, we don't have much uh, problem on health part, but we do have a social and economic crisis uh, within these months because of the pandemic and don't forget the FDIs and uh, uh, what the, the, the companies are based in another country. So, and it was also problematic uh, before even the pandemic. So we'll continue to have these companies closing and this uh, unemployment and job loss. So we saw that uh, many governments found solution uh, to, um, uh, to give some funds to the companies. It depends on the countries. We saw that uh, in Tunisia, we have a startup uh, uh, project uh, that uh, give funds to the startups in same in Morocco. Uh, they, they, they find some plans uh, in order to enhance the, the, the companies. We also have uh, some sub grantings to the uh, uh, some um, 
cultural uh, industries, uh, SMEs. So, so it depends, but each co co government is taking his own decision in order to uh, find solution for the company. It's not the same as Europe, as I said uh, later on. European has a general laws, but of course they also have national uh, activity to confront what is happening to these companies and SMEs. Maybe Renata can give us more information on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mrs. Botiba, for your intervention. And uh, I want now uh, went to Mrs. Renate. Uh, uh, Mrs. Renate, as we have heard from Mr. Mahro, there is a big problem for in social dialogue in some of the South and East Mediterranean country, especially that the government is always taking this the lead position in social dialogue and considering itself as the main uh, interlocutor in this, uh, in this way. And uh, here I will ask you a specific question. As, as I was the senior specialist for employers activities in the Arab state region, Jordan was part of my, my work. And we had all, always faced this problem with the government. Act M and IOE should support much more the employer's organization to face the uh, solid uh, position of the government in this respect. And uh, I want to know from you, uh, what is the agenda of IOE and uh, AMP in this regard? Especially we are facing this issue and Mr. Mahrouf. And I faced when I was senior special, I faced this problem always with the government. And I, I, saw, I, I felt that uh, the position of ILO is always with the workers and government and not too much uh, positioning the employers in what the yani business net now with the solid we are they are working where they are working hard on this we are trying to make the uh, the, uh, uh, the employers having more stand in in this issue but i think ILO and IOE should work much more closely with employers to, to face this issue. Well, um, thank you very much. If I may just make some, some comments. Um, I think the first point on the SMEs and the COVID crisis. Here yes. I can uh, only reiterate, it is very important that employer organizations, if they want to develop political power, they must develop their membership. And the SME is a very important membership, obviously, especially in the South and East Mediterranean, where the economy is based very much on SMEs. And for that, they have to deliver services. They have to help the SMEs. Um, I give you an example, like in, in you know, in, in Germany, for instance, uh, we are out there, we have a local or branch organizations which help companies when they are faced with labor court issues. We help companies when they are faced with uh, skill shortages to help them in training young people, young apprentices. And now very, very, in very, very concrete terms, there's the situation with COVID. Um, I think a very important uh, role for um, employer organizations is to help the SMEs have access to the money the, and the subsidies the governments give, because for that you need to make applications, you need to satisfy condition and so on. And an employer organization can show to SMEs, look, I can help you on this. If you want, if you become my member, you don't have to go to a law firm, which asks much more money from you. You can come to me. And then uh, this is, it. but if they don't sh show um, a uh, service, an added value to the SMEs, obviously the SMEs will see no interest in joining the organization. So I think the employer organizations can be very important intermediaries between the political level, helping and the uh, company level, especially on the SMEs, helping them in all these démarches, uh, uh, in all these sort of um, applications, be uh, with the government and maybe also against the unions when they have labor law issues, accompanying them to the courts and so on and so on. Now, coming to the ILO, um, I, I have to tell you, um, yes, the ILO or, or also IOE should, uh, should do more, but you know, it takes two to tango. If um, 
we, we also need the southern and eastern Mediterranean employer organizations to commit and to engage. And I can tell you from my own experience uh, that sometimes it is very difficult to get in touch on something concrete. And uh, Peter Zeidenek spoke about this project which we did with Tunisia. It was a, uh, it, it took a lot of energy uh, and it was a very successful project. Um, but I would wish to have a similar situation also with Lebanon, which is now in a very difficult uh, economic, political situation and it could help uh, to build up the economy to, to support the employers. But there, I think also they, they should need to show some interest. And then we, we have lots of committed people in the IOE and then including myself who want to help. But if there is no kind of um, response, concrete response or concrete contacts, it's very difficult to give this help. So just to conclude, I think it's really important. It takes two to tango. If you want to get, you must also say, what do you want? Co um, have the facilities and, and be ready to engage in, in these kind of projects. For instance, uh, also about investment, Our the German Chambers of Commerce are planning huge investment conferences um, in, in Lebanon in, and in, in Jordan. Um, I remember the Jordanian um, um, labor minister was in Berlin last, um, well, this was last November, I think exactly a year ago, Mr. Batane, Batane. and we, um, uh, the follow up was that we had very concrete projects for with Lebanese, uh, with the Jordanian um, people from the care sector, specialists from the care sector working, um, uh, coming to work in Germany. So all these things we can, and then going back to, uh, to, to Jordan, all these things we can do, but there has to be a concrete engagement and also uh, the, how should I say, the, the tango partner must be active as well. It's not a one way road, um, the, the possibility to communicate and to, to help and to make projects for the development of the region. So with this said, I, I am afraid I will have to leave you because I have another commitment. So thank you very much, but I look forward to staying in touch with all of you and uh, after the seminar as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giannos. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Renate, for your time. Uh, uh, Mr. Mahrou, uh, uh, can you, uh, in two minutes or so, give us your position about the SMEs and uh, the COVID and how you can, uh, and employers' organization, how they can help in this issue? Thank you very much, Hisham. Again, uh, for, for the SMEs, first part, uh, what, what can social dialogue help, actually, uh, in, in this uh, uh, special circumstances or unique circumstances actually that we are facing uh, within the, the pandemic time. Uh, actually, as you know that uh, the majority of our business is a small and medium enterprises uh, and specifically when I'm talking about uh, Jordan. And uh, uh, actually, uh, the, the, uh, to be honest and frank with you that, uh, uh, and uh, you might actually uh, you might be surprised by my answer, actually, uh, all of you, uh, that uh, this is uh, an extraordinary uh, pandemic that haven't been expected to have it this way. Uh, so all of our uh, all of our plans, uh, uh, honestly speaking, uh, uh, and uh, mainly and specifically for the countries whom they started facing this pandemic by a complete shutdown, like Jordan. Uh, we found ourselves that are, we are disabled to do anything for uh, our firms. And uh, the first uh, issue that we are spent our efforts, uh, the majority of our efforts that have been directed uh, to keep our uh, uh, firms working during the complete shutdown and to convince the governments uh, how we can keep the, uh, the industrial sector going, uh, working and uh, continue uh, 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 working during the, the shutdown. And, uh, but I would actually add uh, to that, uh, if, if, uh, uh, that, uh, that the, major, the major thing that we can do during that time, but uh, uh, due to, uh, as I mentioned, was a, was a unique uh, uh, or outstanding situation uh, that needs an outstanding or to think out of the box, I think the service is the key uh, success factor that we have to be ready uh, with it in the future. And this could uh, could uh, could put some some efforts or some let's say 
it, I don't know if, it, if I can uh, use the word of responsibility on the ILO or on the IOE or even on the business med, uh, which is the emergency plans in such cases and what kind of services that the employer organizations have to be ready uh, with and the level of development. Uh, we have been developed actually several services during the last 10 years as a Jordan Chamber of Industry. Uh, but when we face this, uh, uh, this crisis or this pandemic, actually, uh, we find ourselves that uh, we are not able to do any anything for our uh, uh, for our members uh, because everybody was uh, was 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 kept watching. Uh, what's next? What we have to do? Uh, what kind of decisions? Uh, so I think such kind of of, of uh, or lack of understanding uh, uh, for uh, for the role of social dialogue uh, was mainly the major. Uh, issue that put us in a position and kept all of us uh, holding on, uh, waiting uh, what kind of steps that could be taken from this party or from the other party. And this put a huge pressure on the government and pushed the government to take a decision uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, activate uh, the defense law and to use it uh, because we are not being able uh, uh, to talk to each other at, at the beginning of the crisis. And uh, at the same time, we kept asking that we have to continue and we have to work. Uh, but how we, go, we are going to work? What kind of facilities? Uh, what, kind, what kind of cooperation with our workers? Uh, what kind of, uh, are we going to pay the whole sal salaries or not? We haven't been talking with each other or we haven't following the approach or we haven't been utilized the outcomes of social dialogue uh, so this actually uh, put us in a position to be under the control of the government during the first four months almost of the crisis. Uh, so, but if we, if we have been uh, uh, believe first of all, or we have been uh, 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 believe in the outcomes of, of social dialogue, or at least we believe in social dialogue as a concept, I think uh, this was the best time uh, to utilize uh, the outcomes that we have from social dialogue uh, and uh, it could be the, the, the best tool uh, that could be directed uh, uh, to, uh, to utilize uh, or to uh, uh, the best tool could be used actually in such kind of, of circumstances and to keep in balance uh, uh, or to keep the balance between uh, the, tri the three parties uh, whom they are uh, uh, in, in, this, in this concept. And uh, I think this could highlight the issues even, uh, you know, the, the services could be uh, and we have to think of the different concept, not the different concept of services, uh, but we have to think of, of having or initiating a services for our members in cooperation with, uh, with different organizations, uh, ILO, IOE, Business Med, uh, uh, our counterparts. And why not to, to start initiating the services uh, that, uh, that could utilize the benefits of our members and the, the workers at the same time, and in cooperation and in negotiation with the government and with the trade unions, uh, so as to make it uh, effective as much as we can. So I think the key success factor is the services that we can direct it uh, to SMEs specifically at this stage. And uh, you know, the major thing that we are facing now, <clears throat> which is I mean, repeated many times, uh, you know that by the defense law that we have it in Jordan now, it's not allowed for any, any firm uh, uh, to cancel any contract for any worker. Uh, but uh, this defense uh, uh, law is not going to exist for uh, for good, uh, and uh, uh, and all of the firms they are being influenced by the government to pay the salaries, uh, despite of the of the financial situation that they have and uh, the the shutdown that we are facing. Uh, so, in case of of opening or in case of of the when the government is stopped, the defense law. And the question that we are raising, are they going to keep all of the workers that they have? Uh, especially at the beginning of the crisis, they found it themselves that they are able to work with 60% of their uh, labor force. They don't know, need uh, the whole employees that they, they have in their uh, firms. And they found themselves that, that they are okay with only 60% of the original number of, of employees that they have. Imagine if such uh, uh, such a question that have been answered that oh, uh, that fifty percent of the firms are going to or asking to release uh, 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 thirty percent of their employees. Imagine the the, the unemployment rate in Jordan. Uh, uh, what's going to happen? 
يعني this is this is quite I think uh, uh, the most worrying question actually for the government right right now and for the for the trade unions and for us as well as as an employer organizations because we don't accept this kind of, of attitude but at least when you look at the firms uh, this is the case of, of of that we have for the SMEs right now actually uh, they are they are uh, uh, enforced to keep to keep all of the all of the, the employees that they have and to pay the salaries with a minimum 80% for the ones whom they are not working uh, uh, they have to pay 80% of their salaries uh, and uh, it's not allowed for them uh, to reduce the salaries or to work uh, per hours or uh, or to reduce the level of salaries. And at the same time, they lost part of their markets, whether locally or, or internationally. Uh, you know, this equation is quite not fair from their point of view, and they have the right actually to say it's not fair. Uh, but uh, uh, again, if the, 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 the defense law has, has stopped sometime, a month, two months ago, next year, early next year. So what's, what's the case of, of, of the extra employees and between the brackets actually extra employees in the firms? What we gonna, what we gonna do with them and how we can help the firms and we, how we can help, help the workers because when um, unemployment rate comes to this level, actually it's quite a, a, a threat uh, for everybody. That's it, thank you Hisham. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mahri. I, I, I love to have Mr. Watt stay with us so he can answer uh, this question because I think we have to listen a little bit to Akhtaraf and the workers, what they are saying about this difficult situation for the company. Uh, 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 Jihan, you asked me a question what about the social dialogue. I think the problem of the social dialogue in our region is that uh, it is taken as an activity, as not and not as a real tool to uh, 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 to handle the problems that we are facing at the level of uh, uh, employment, employability, labor market, uh, 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 productivity, uh, uh, everything. Because social terror can touch every aspect of our life in. In, uh, in, in the economic and political agenda also. Uh, the problem is taken as it is an activity. Ah, let's go, we will have a social dialogue. Uh, 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 we will go to see the government, but in their mind, especially the employers, they always think that we can handle the issue with the government under the table. And this is a big problem. They also think that uh, uh, lobbying and uh, advocacy can be their only main tool to handle any, any questions they have regarding employment and employability. And this is wrong. We have to build, we have to build the knowledge and professionalism of employers' organizations to, uh, 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 to use the tool of social dialogue to be part of their uh, uh, of their if you want of their lobbying and advocacy should be part of of it it should be the social dialogue because they can reach many part of the society many uh, 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 they can reach the workers they can build a if uh, they can build a cooperation with the workers when they, they are working on social dialogue. They can soften the position of the government if they use the social dialogue. But in reality, they do not take social dialogue as serious as it is. This was before, and now it is the same. I think they did not change any from my understanding of them. And also Maher will agree with me uh, the, uh, on this. Uh, uh, when yani Maher, Maher is now the director of the Jordan Chamber, but uh, Maher understand perfectly what is social dialogue, and he can work on it. But it is not also it is not only what Maher can do. It is the president of the chamber, uh, uh, the board member of the chamber, other employ uh, uh, and the mem and the members of the of, of the chambers also. 
It is something that they should be part of the knowledge of professionalism. If we, can, if we will not have some professional people inside each employer organization that are working on social dialogue and they are high professional people, we cannot move and use social dialogue in, in, in what we are thinking. And I think solid two, solid one and solid two, they try to, to build uh, the capacity of employers organization. And we should follow on this and we should work on capacity building because they have to understand that it is the only way now. When we are talking about PPP, private public partnership, it is part, social dialogue is part of PPP. How can they make any private public private partnership without a without social dialogue? Because the other part on a, PP, on a PPP project or anything they want to build on PPP, it are the workers and those people who will work, who will be the employee. We are all employee in a way or another. So they have to understand that the only way is the social dialogue. Uh, it, it is not easy to do it. And uh, also from the other part, we have to make the government understand that you cannot buy the defensive law in Jordan and uh, 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 the law that it is imposing now in Lebanon or in, in, in Tunisia, I don't know how they are. It is not by enforcing this that you can make the economy work. You can but by enforcing, you have the people should be convinced the employer should be convinced, the employee should be convinced, the worker should be convinced, everybody should be convinced. They have to understand it, but in our region, this, you know that, that there is a thin line between convincing and enforcing. It, it, is, it is a big problem, but we can, I think, by taking a, a way of building the knowledge, building professionalism, building capacity of employers organization. As Renata said, we, the employers organization should be more of involved in this process, not taking it as simple activity we are doing with businessmen or with, uh, with ILO or with ACTM or with it. No, it is a real tool that they have to use. It. They, should in, they should understand the importance of this tool. They should be they should be convinced about how what they can achieve what they, what they can achieve if they use the if they use this tool in the right way in the good way and in a productive way. It, 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 it is a question that we have to rise it and we have to face it and we have to work on it. Yani we have to make this dichotomy in their mind between social dialogue and lobbying and advocacy. Lobbying and advocacy, it's a tool, and social dialogue is a tool. And not any one of these can cover the other. Okay, so um, we, we can conclude. Uh, you, can, the... you can conclude, Jihad. Oh, you give me the hardest part. Uh... Yes, no, no, that's the hardest part. My conclusion do you is want me, uh, Do you want me to conclude? No, but I, I prefer fine. that you conclude. We can do it both, but uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not quite, I'm, I'm quite surprised that you, uh, you talked expressly today, but it was fine because it's the first time I, I, I hear most of the employers saying the truth and completely the truth uh, coming from the employers, uh, uh, from the southern region, and the the, the, the big conclusion that you can we can do is that has been said by Dr. Meher, is that indeed the, between social partner we discussed, but at the end we find that our governments are taking initiative and uh, they they taking a decision by their own, and uh, we uh, fund them uh, uh, to to to. Uh, the first period of the pandemic, the first month is to take a solution, but they were, uh, they didn't know how to do it. But the, the, the fact is that the uh, companies and uh, most of the new generation know about digitalization and they, uh, 
fund the solution in order to continue to work, in order to continue to have the uh, enterprises continue to leave. But at the end, uh, in our southern countries, it's uh, the, the, the need from the government to involve uh, all the social partners in this decision and in this discussion. And uh, as you said, uh, social dialogue, it's not just a concept. Uh, you find social dialogue everywhere. And uh, last time I was explaining to my, uh, my son, uh, his, uh, he said, what is politics? So I took the example of social dialogue. I said, for example, if uh, you go to McDonald's and they make you work uh, 30 hours, uh, so you are an employee and you go to your uh, boss and said, no, I don't want to work uh, all this time. And uh, you go into negotiation with him. This is explained to a kid, I mean. But it's a good example. You leave social dialogue every day in your life. So you, you have to understand that social dialogue, it's a way of life. It's not a perception or something we discuss one day or two days or three days or during a project. It's something that you have to live with. And you find that the government are taking decision without uh, including social partners. And this is not completely fair in the southern countries. So you have to uh, bring your voices to this government and make you make this decision uh, made by the companies and made by the employees because they are the first concern on this uh, i mean on this in this life and you saw that the pandemic touches more or less the government more than the, the companies and the employees in terms of uh, unemployment so the conclusion is for the southern countries, we have to raise our voice to the government. That's it. it is the only thing we can say, because on the other side, if you involve all the social partners, of course, they will uh, take decision and they will do their best in order to discuss, as we did with uh, Dr. Mayer in, uh, in, so in SOLID, or uh, they do all the days in uh, OEI and they do also in, in ILO. But the fact is that uh, not much things has been done and we didn't move forward. Uh, even if we signed so many convention, uh, it's not the convention or the, the, the charter that would change anything if the governments are not involved in social partners. Okay, thank you, Jihan. I also, if I want to conclude, I think first of all, we have not to match or overlap between collective bargaining uh, uh, lobbying, uh, 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 advocacy, and social dialogue. Social dialogue is is something is something uh, standing alone, uh, uh, and we have to use it frequently in our life, in our decision making, in at, uh, at the level of uh, between the government and uh, the social party. Uh, I think myself that no, not a simple government in the South and East Mediterranean countries that will be happy to involve social partners in their decision. But what we can do as businessmen, because we are, because businessmen is a, a regional, uh, uh, a regional organization with the help of IOE and other and ILO and other international organizations that we have to put some pressure on the government to accept other social partners to be involved in decision making. This is what we can help also because Renate simply said that it is also only the involvement how much they are powerful, the employers organization, how much they are. No, it is not only. It's not simply this point. It is also how much we can, as international and regional organization, we can put some pressure on the government to make them understand that you have other partners that should be involved in the decision. Otherwise, they will not, they will not do it. Nobody, nobody will accept that to have someone who will interfere in his decision, especially at the level of the political decisions they have. And uh, in this way, I think if Solid 2 will work, we have also to work on, uh, on, on this, uh, uh, this point uh, uh, in this regard. And uh, 
social, social dialogue, it's not the solution, it is the tool. The social dialogue will find the solution for the problem. This should also be understood that social dialogue, what can do social dialogue to SMEs? Cannot do anything directly. Social dialogue, it will build a policy that it will help SMEs to recover and face, face, uh, uh, face the situation. Uh, so <clears throat> it is many folds. Social dialogue is on many folds that we have to work on. And of course, it is the only way now that we have to face the uh, uh, post-pandemic era that we will be facing in a few months uh, in, at the level of the world. This is what, this is what I have to conclude uh, regarding this issue. Thank you so much, Hisham, and thank you for all the participants that stayed till the end. And uh, thank you for moderating. And Dr. Mayer, thank you for being you, uh, always with us and supportive. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. For, sorry for not getting uh, Dr. Mustafa with us, but hopefully in our next webinar on social dialogue, we'll have all the, the partners seeing you next time in our uh, webinar. Mm -hmm.